Welcome, everyone. As we are admitting folks, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Micah Jeltsma. I am the Open Education Librarian at the University of Minnesota. Uh, just as we sort of are welcoming people in before we get started, just to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to be here, um, you can go ahead and, and do our little kind of chat activity today. Um, go ahead and kind of uh, mention to us your pronouns, where you're from. Uh, I thought for a topic, I was thinking a lot about, you know, as it as it gets sunny, the summer side salads that I've been missing so much, the slaws and the salads, and please comment with your favorite summer side salad. I am planning a party with a couple of friends uh, in the next weeks for a, a pasta salad party where we're all bringing different kinds of pasta salads and I'm very excited about it. Um, so yeah, as you uh, enter, go ahead and kind of comment. Um, again, just let us know where you're from and we'll get started shortly. Some good, good salads already. Strawberry poppy seed salad. Tomato and watermelon at the same time. Sorry, maybe it's rude to ask food questions, but it is, you know, after lunch for some, hopefully that helps a little bit. Maybe it'll just whet the appetite of others. Um, thank you so much again, if, if you're kind of just entering here, um, our, our little activity is to enter in your, uh, you know, where you're from and maybe a favorite summer side salad that you're looking forward to as it warms up. All right, it looks like we've got quite a few people here, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. So hello and welcome to the Edu Open Education Network's Pub 101. Um, thanks for joining us for today's session. My name is Micah Jeltima. I'm the Open Education and Affordable Content Librarian at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. So I'll be uh, hosting and facilitating today, um, but soon I will be handing it off to Christina Trinal, the Assistant Dean of the Library at Montana State University. Um, she'll be talking about inclusion in the context of open education publishing. As always, we will leave time for your questions and conversation, and there may be some of you who have a lot of experience in this topic um, in addition to our guests. So we do invite you to share your experiences and resources. We like to keep the chat lively, um, and as always, kind of feel free to uh, share links to any resources that you think other people might be uh, really interested in. Um, before we go, I'm going to have a couple housekeeping details. Um, we do have an orientation document that includes um, links to a lot of the materials that we'll be talking about here. I'm going to go ahead and just right now put in the chat our link tree. Um, so this is a link that has all of our other links in it. So you can kind of browse those as we speak today. I will also be um, entering links as are, are relevant to our conversation. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, please do remember that there is also that companion resource for these sessions, the Pub 101 Canvas curriculum that is also within that link tree. And that's where you'll find a lot of the resources and templates that we mentioned. This session is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube Pub 101 Spring 2024 playlist. Um, there's also a transcript being generated that will include not only the uh, you know, audio and video of this, um, but it will also include the chat material. So if you are kind of panicking, as I sometimes do, as people put in incredible resources and links to things in the chat, um, that should all be preserved for you to uh, access later as well. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everyone aligned with our community norms. Um, so please join us in creating a safe and constructive space, particularly for today's uh, topic of inclusion. Um, and finally, I'll just go ahead and, and pop that link in the chat again, just to be sure. Um, that is the link tree, um, and that will have the links to all of the other materials that I've just discussed and uh, that you may be um, experiencing as we go forward or want to catch up on after the session. So hopefully that's all very clear. Um, I will now go ahead and hand things over to Christina to talk about inclusion. Thanks, Micah. Share my slides with you all here. Um, so it's a delight for me to be here. I, I love Pump, Pub 101 and all the resources that it gives to you all. And as Micah said, I'm going to be talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our uh, publishing and especially in Ibn Publishing. Um, as I do that, I just want to recognize that our social and political climate has shifted in the last years or a couple, um, to be honest, to make having these conversations uh, a little more challenging at some institutions or within your states. So recognizing that, um, we will have, I will pause and give you space to like ask really specific questions or um, I will also put out that 
uh, my contact info is here. Um, on this first slide, the slides will be shared out with you all. So if you uh, have an issue that you maybe want a sounding board or want to talk about um, outside of this, feel free to reach out to me specifically. I'm happy to have those conversations with you. So today we will um, talk about how to incorporate some active DEI engagement in your publishing program. And this, when I say publishing program, I'm talking about if you have or are creating a full program, if it's just you at your institution, you working with one author, you trying to get a couple authors through, all of these options, um, I would like us to think about active engagement with DEI work. Um, so uh, I will talk about some of the risk and responsibility that comes with that, um, how to develop a first approach to DEI instead of a remedial approach, uh, some specifics about incorporating um, DEI into course materials, including design and information equity, and then some of the self-care and then the empowerment that comes with this type of work or is needed with this type of work. So that's what we're going to go over. Um, if you have questions or thoughts, please pop those in the chat. I will try to monitor that, um, but I'll be pausing periodically so you can ask those as well. And then as Micah said, we'll have a um, Q&A time at the end. So I always start any conversation um, about this topic with these two statements that I think are really essential for us to ground ourselves in. And that is equity is human and equity work is honest. Um, humans are not easy or succinct. They are messy and loud and problematic and beautiful and equity work is going to be all of those things. So as we think about it, remember, it is a very human type of work that we do. And it is also honest. We cannot change or fix or be better at any equity-based work if we're not honest about where we're at in that work. So those are the two things that um, I will ask you to keep at top of mind, but also when you leave this session and as you have struggles or if you're questioning things, remember, this is human work and it is honest. So ground rules for publishing support. Um, and I, I'm talking to you all as if you are the publishing support to people uh, on your campuses or at your institutions. But these are also my ground rules for any type of conversation about race, diversity, inclusion, equity, or allyship. And the first question is, is this important work? Is it things that we should, is it something that we should be doing? And if your answer is at all yes, then the first thing we have to do is accept the risk. This is a risky type of academic work because it is human. It, it, it often will not go well. So when you accept the risk, you accept, will it always go well? Maybe not. Maybe you'll try something or put forward a policy or a, um, equity statement that doesn't work well, that is rejected, or you get negative feedback, or people don't understand what you're trying to say. Um, it won't always go well, but that's okay because it's important work. It's worth doing. Will you make mistakes? That's kind of the human part. We do. We all make them. I've made them so many times, uh, but it's worth staying in the conversation for. And a lot of uh, people that I work with and talk to in this area, they maybe have made a mistake and it, it makes them shy from staying in the DEI conversation. And I would say it's, it's always worth the risk, but be honest about your mistakes. You know, when I put forth this policy and I did not consider how it would affect this particular group. So let me rethink this and do a different job um, that maybe connects with all groups. We're not going to get it perfect. We're not going to get right 100% of the time. But being honest about being in the conversation is really important. And then the, the second thing I want to talk about is um, 
what is the responsibility you have in this, in your role for academic publishing? Um, you have space to offer guidance to authors, but is the creation of the textbook or the uh, OER that you're helping to publish uh, yours or is it theirs? And whose responsibility is it to make a good work? And um, I think that's a real challenge for me because I'm, I might have standards that my authors do not on certain things. So knowing where you're able to have the conversation is really important. So if you're thinking about from a publishing support side, what resources can you have to give your authors to say, please, you know, consider all of these things as you're writing your textbook? Please consider incorporating some of these into your textbook. How do you make a resource that covers that area, um, but also leaves the onus on the author to complete it? Uh, we can publish textbooks that we don't agree with or we don't, um, we think could be done differently, but that's not our job to judge. So uh, as we do this, think about what's your obligation? Where can you provide guidance? And then are there minimum standards for publishing? Um, most Many of you probably heard from my colleague Jackie last week about accessibility. And so thinking about what are the standards that have to be met for accessibility, I think is a really good way to start a DEI conversation. What are my minimum standards? Or what can I ask my authors to consider? And if I'm gonna publish something that doesn't meet at least the standard, that's gonna be different based on your institution, uh, based on your program, based on your state, uh, how you are funded. So all of those factors have to come into play, but those are questions that I think um, really are foundational for where you go individually with this work. So how do we jump into DEI? I think it stems from system thinking, right? Uh, and I pulled a couple of snippets from Wikipedia's definition of systemic racism. And for me, these are very uh, indicative of academic publishing. It's embedded in normal practices. It originates in operation of established and respected forces in society, but is more established and respected than academic publishing, which does not endeavor to be racist, right? So there are systems already in place that we are working with and trying to make better. And so if we pause our system thinking and we come back to what we're creating. Um, a, a, a great essay that I really like that kind of grounds me, but uh, that's me, is Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on art. And in it, he says that all, all artists, so I'm thinking of our authors, right? All authors, creation is the aim. They want to create something new. And yet he posits that we are incapable of creating anything that is not influenced by our society, our family, our religion, our culture, um, the time period that we're alive. So that we have all of these influences. And what we do is we end up imitating them, whether we're trying to create something new and great or not. Um, and so imitation is what he says is the finest form of art, which I think is interesting. But that imitation is if we're doing system thinking and we're thinking of systemic racism, systemic forms of oppression, systemic uses of language that are harmful, they're already embedded in what you and your authors are doing. So I'd like you to consider stepping back from that system thinking and consider perspective. And what that means to me is we can work really hard on all of this stuff and our perspective might be as small as a ladybug's because we can only see what we're looking at. 
So that first perspective um, that I said I was going to talk to you about, that's how I think we are successful in DEI, in academic publishing and open publishing, is from the first point of contact with our authors, with our programs as we're developing them, if we start to embed how many perspectives, what other perspectives besides ours, we will stop imitating the systems that we have, um, that we're a part of and including more perspectives beyond what we're traditionally um, trained to do. And that's really important. Otherwise we are just the ladybug following in the footsteps of everything that's come before us. And open education has such power to shift um, academic publishing with a more inclusive, equity-centered perspective. So for your program and how you talk to you, uh, your authors, first, think about what your goal is. So what is your goal in open education publishing? Free access to educational resources, money saved for our students, those are easy. But do we have a bigger goal? I'll show mine in the next slide. And then how do we approach that goal from a first approach? How do we include those perspectives? And if we're doing those two things, uh, we do create a foundation of inclusivity. So we've put together a great guide for authors, um, some checklists, some resources that you can use and share out with your authors. Again, those are, uh, as Micah said, in the curriculum. So they're already embedded there and I'm happy to point them out and share links at the end. But these can help you create that foundation of inclusivity. My goal uh, when I first started in open education was this challenge of, am I just delivering content? Am I creating or publishing a resource that just delivers content? And if I'm doing that, am I not ensuring that my students are maybe less prepared to engage in a multicultural, oops, multicultural world. Uh, they're getting a one-sided or skewed potentially view of the issue um, or demonstrating one truth learning as the many textbooks that I've used in the past just share one point of view. Um, my students are not learning how to speak and interact with a diverse world without adding to this structure of inequity or bias. And they are also inadvertently learning implicit bias that supports this system, system thinking, this structure of oppression. So if I wanna challenge any of these, then I'm going to start looking at my content that I'm putting into my publications, my textbooks a little differently. And this is the problem that I think we have a great ability to help shift in our roles. Okay, so how do we do this? Things to ask our authors to consider, things that we want to maybe question about the books that we're helping support. Uh, number one, do they reach their target audience? Uh, depending on what size and type of institution you're coming from. This is a bigger challenge for some. Community colleges are pretty awesome at reaching their target audience um, for and onward universities sometimes have a harder time with this. So reaching the audience, we, um, we're professionals. Our faculty are writers. They know how to write. They're teaching. Um, but often they're doing it in the manner uh, of writing that they're consuming as a professional. So the first uh, thing that I ask uh, in authors is, is the language approachable? And, and this is something we really can lean on the academic publishing world to support us in. Um, however we feel about academic publishers and their business models, um, they, they are very smart at hiring knowledgeable people that know how to put information in a way that's approachable. So is the language approachable? Are the vocabularies built into the, the information they're sharing? Are they highlighting terms and defining them? 
are they talking to their audience, your, their students, uh, as if they already know all this content? So it's something that if you're publishing, um, it doesn't matter what level of textbook to challenge your authors with. Did they explain these concepts? Did they build the vocabularies from unit to unit? Another question that is really important to me is, are the scenarios relatable? Uh, maybe they're applicable to the field of study, but are they relevant to the students that they're speaking to? So one of the best examples um, I've come across is a business accounting text. And all the examples were talking about um, different equity that you would get in the home buying and, and reselling and financing portion of how to buy a home and um, that type of accounting for a business to invest in properties. All the examples were in the multi-millions. And the, the class that was uh, using this textbook was largely migrant uh, and immigrant families, low uh, English first language population. Um, so the scenarios might be applicable to the topic, but are they relevant to your students? Do they make sense to your students? Can we explain this concept in a way that your students would get? Um, really key in inclusivity. Uh, in design equity, uh, one of the most common things that we think about in the open education world is diversity of representation and images, right? We have a lot of really great resources out there in Creative Commons uh, licensed images to represent diverse people. Is that incorporated into their text? But I would also say in other examples, similar to what I just was speaking about, but also experiences. Are the experiences, are the stories they're sharing relatable to a diverse group of people? Maybe your faculty member um, is in rangeland science and everything is about life on the farm, but the farm they're talking about is a different level than maybe some of the students they're trying to reach. So do we have a different or a diversity within those examples and experiences? Same with names. Names are really common, but let's make sure our textbooks have a diversity of representation that students can self-identify with some of those names and a diverse group of students. And then I also um, really challenge authors to, however they want to publish, consider is there a diversity of formats available that their students can access? So yes, we're publishing in open education, but are there low cost print options? Is there a PDF option that they can turn into an MP4 and get the audio? So what other options can this faculty provide? Can you provide? Easy things to consider upfront. Same with, is it accessible? Um, remediating, going back through and making those changes after a text has already been written is a challenge. So is it, something they're considering up front. When you talk about accessibility, and you've already heard about some really good accessibility options, but I wanna go back to that, how publisher textbooks look compared to a lot of OER. So yes, we wanna make sure it meets accessibility standards, but also thinking about our audience. Uh, is there a to the reader guide? that explains to this new student how to use this textbook. What are the key places they should look? Are there questions at the end of each section that allow them to connect back to the material? That's a really simple thing to add into a textbook that really makes a dynamic difference to a variety of learners. So is there a guide on how to use the text? Um, are they explicitly calling out the connection to additional reading or other ancillary materials that they're providing. So I'm thinking about an author that I worked with who created a writing textbook uh, and press books and didn't include um, 
a lot of ancillary materials and resources that they use in their course that are really quite key in that textbook because they didn't want to have to go up and update the links uh, commonly or worry about broken links. And it left it left such richness out of the textbook. So instead, what I challenged this faculty with that turned out very well is to call out those resources. Watching this video is really helpful. Maybe you put the link in, maybe you don't. Maybe you just put a citation so that others can find it. But are you calling out why it's helpful and connecting the student who's trying to learn to the written material and the ancillary material. So making those connections and really being explicit uh, is a design equity uh, element that really makes the text inclusive. Uh, and then, so those are things we can do style-wise that really help. Then we come to the content. And I, I call this the tricky part because we're not the authors of the content. And you don't want to, I don't want to make any of you feel like I'm asking you to question your author's content, <laughs> not. But I want to give you some guides to help them to think about their content, hopefully before they create it or get to the, here's my text, I'm ready to publish stage, um, because it will make their content richer. So severed, uh, three things, subject coverage, is it honest and inclusive? Um, are the perspectives covered in material inclusive and relevant to the subject? And is the language inclusive and devoid of microaggressions? So those are three ways that you've probably already heard about. I'm gonna go through really quickly, and then I'm gonna pause for some questions um, that we can make sure or ask our, our authors to make sure to consider as they're creating the material. So, Information equity, is that subject coverage honest and inclusive? This is really important. Um, and it's important to talk about the honesty part. Again, it comes down to that perspective where my perspective is and how limited or diverse it may be. Um, if I'm writing about my subject matter, I'm gonna use history examples because those are easy for me. Um, <laughs> But, but this is applicable to a variety of subjects. If I'm saying, here's, here's what happened in Rwanda in the late 1990s and the situation about that uh, genocide, do I say explicitly in my text, not just the situation, but where that perspective is coming from? Western news reported this situation. Um, am I being honest that this does not include the accounts of uh, locals at the time or maybe from U uh, United Nations uh, officers at the time? Is it being honest about the limitations? And this is kind of a tricky place for some faculty because they might feel like you're questioning them. You're not you're asking is this honest representation. And what I have found is the more honest they are about what's missing or what uh, further study could be, it invites engagement by the student. It invites them to, or it, elic it, it elicits inquiry. They're interested. They're maybe looking up what they're missing. My textbook said this, but uh, it also said it was missing this. That's similar to perspectives um, that are covered. So if I'm talking about a particular situation event, um, am I including all sides? Am I saying the um, January 6th elections uh, riot that happened in the United States was this? Then am I including first person accounts from different groups or just one group? Am I giving news coverage from a neutral side or am I showing the diversity of opinion? So let's be honest about that in our text. That's a really great thing to include or encourage faculty to include. Um, and then also is my the language inclusive and devoid of microaggressions. This is a harder thing for um, a lot of especially your white faculty 
to understand all the microaggressions that are out there. So challenge them to consider gender neutral language and person first language. We have a great guide um, that the OEN has put together with some links to those resources, uh, but it's really, really important to students to address that inclusive language. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there and see if there's questions. I see a couple things um, came in chat. So uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, but is there anything that I've talked about that you're interested in or wanna hear more about or challenge? And I see Amanda just shared the diverse names generator, which is fabulous because then you're not responsible for having to be creative. <laughs> Think of your own names. Okay. So if you have more questions, pop them in the chat. Um, if you're not comfortable, we're about to the Q&A portion anyway. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Can, can I ask you a little bit about when you're having these conversations, are you trying to do everything up front? Are you, I don't know, providing feedback more incrementally along the way or what have you found is effective? So I found, and I, I guess I'm asking you to do two things. So I'll go into that, but I found the most effective, Sarah, is to approach this up front. Um, the more you can start people thinking about perspectives other than their own and what their intention is, the better quality content, the more inclusive content they're creating. So if I have an author come to me, um, I'll give you two examples. One, we might offer a grant, a faculty member wants to write a a book on X topic. So I'll just say sign language. That's one we recently did, right? Write a sign language textbook. I want to get in before they've done any kind of content creation or maybe are just in their planning stage and say, here's things to consider, right? Are you considering the skin tone of the, the drawn hand symbols you're putting on your page. Are you considering, you know, these types of perspectives? Is the situation that you're having your students or conversation that you're having them talk about, are there other conversations that might be more relevant to a different variety of your students? Can we give them multiple examples instead of Johnny saw Susie at the grocery store and asked her on a date, like, we, you know, are we giving a variety that might be relevant? So the sooner I can um, get in that conversation, I think it's the most effective because I'm never going to tell them how to write their text. Um, but it helps them to start thinking about things they wouldn't. Uh, the, uh, the flip side would be a faculty member comes to me and says, Hey, I wrote this textbook and I heard you could make it open access. Can we, can you help me publish this? They've already created their content. So I will take the same resource and say, you know, sure, of course, here's the steps to this process. But also, did you consider these things in your textbook? Would it be helpful if I shared some resources with you, like where you can find diverse images or the diverse names. Um, these are things that make the most successful textbooks. And so it's um, it's easier for them not to have to remediate, but I feel like my responsibility isn't telling them how to write. It's here's some things to consider and I'm gonna do that no matter where they are in the process. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I can see where that ideal is getting that information out in front. Yeah. And so then as you're thinking about the other, the flips, the other thing I was going to say is as you're thinking about your publishing program, if you're thinking about these same things 
from the start or in the middle or wherever you're at and saying, okay, who are we leaving out? Um, one of the things I found we had um, the state had a faculty grant program and I had a really, I had money to give away, which is not the norm in OER world, right? I had money to give away. And I had faculty that just were not applying and not interested in, in using open education um, because it was tied to this grant funding. And what I learned was in rural um, sparse economic areas, this idea of a grant uh, application process was just that language was not inclusive. It was putting up barriers. So I had to redo the marketing and relook at the language to say, here's all the great things you could do and how I could support you, right? Like how are we even within our programs using language that's approachable, that's um, maybe some diverse scenarios of how they could get to their funding or get to our help. So I think talking with authors, but also looking at our program and how we're connecting with our faculty authors uh, are both areas that I would consider this work valuable, I guess. Other questions? Thanks, Katie, for the <laughs> anthropomorphic animals um, comment. That's great. I think Amanda and I probably have the same list of diverse image sources that are out there. So yeah, you show that out. That's great. Okay. Um, so last thing before we, I kind of pause entirely for other open Q and A's is. I, I feel like it's really valuable. This work's so important, um, not just in the field of open education, and and most of us believe that education be should be equally accessible to all. Um, but I think I feel like it's really important in our society and our world as a whole. And I want to I I like to spend some time acknowledging that um, sometimes it comes with discomfort, obviously. Due to my slide, are you com are you totally comfortable having some of these conversations? Um, and and if the answer is maybe or not entirely or not really at all, uh, that's completely okay. Um, so going back to that, how to have these conversations entirely? Um, honesty, equity is human, equity is honest. So be honest with yourself about. The fact that this is hard, um, the fact that maybe you're not comfortable with this, we kind of have to dive in because it matters. And if it matters to you, you have to dive in, um, but only by openly addressing how you feel about it, can you actually get more comfortable. So if you say, hey, this is a cool resource and I wanna have this conversation with my faculty, but I feel really uncomfortable, then let's have a conversation with about it. Um, the important thing to remember about the human aspect is because equity is a human issue, it means you're never alone in this work. Um, there are so many other humans in here with you uh, and, and are happy to have the conversation with you and say, oh, I totally, I totally missed that. <laughs> that one, or I felt like that was so uncomfortable. I've had those conversations where I had to turn around five minutes later and write an email and say, you know what? I'm pretty sure I said this wrong. Here's what I meant for you to hear. I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable. People appreciate honesty. So the more honest we are with ourselves, the better we get at this work. Um, and the other is to truly actively care for yourself. It costs, it's like an emotional labor cost to jump into some of these conversations, especially when you're not confident or you don't feel sure where they're going to go. So if I know I'm going to have that conversation, I give myself like breathing room beforehand and after. Like I, I budget into my calendar. Okay, I'm going to need a minute to like get mentally clear or 
breathe afterwards. So take care of yourself as you're doing this work because it really matters. And it's the unseen work that tends to get put aside for the routine of the systems that we're already in. And we have to actively take care of ourselves in this process. So um, that is my mental uh, self <laughs> um, soul care advice for this type of work. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, but I really do encourage you all to know that it it is, it's valuable and important. Um, and many of our values, including the OEM support this. So come back to it. If you need to take a break, but reach out, connect with this community. It's a rich community and we're here for you in this. So it's my big spiel, but, um, there's a lot of great resources. The couple that I um, talked about in um, that you may want to use, again, they're in the Pub 101 curriculum, but one is this guiding authors towards inclusive content creation. You can take that. You can, oops, I didn't put the link. Sorry. Getting you the link. Um, you can take that and modify it to fit your um, institution. And then uh, we have a great, on the same page, there's a couple of great links, um, but the OEN has um, this diversity, equity, and inclusion rubric that um, goes into some detail about what I talked about. But when you get down to the guides and lexicons, there's some really great resources for inclusive language. So I'm going to share both of those here. Um, yeah. Questions, challenges, okay. struggles at your institution where you can't talk about equity. I'm happy to hear them all. Thanks so much, Christina. I'm going to jump in right ahead of questions for something that will sort of uh, dovetail with those questions. So do do keep uh, writing those if you are. Keep thinking about them if you are. Um, but yeah, again, thank you, Christina, so much for sharing your experience. Um, I really love the reminder that it is human work. I think a lot of people sort of feel that, you know, DEI work, that it is a dangerous game sometimes and that we can sort of avoid taking risks by using sort of what we think of as objective academic language, but it's a really great reminder that that language is not objective and it really is still on us to kind of be making more of an effort and being brave and being human. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I have linked in our chat a link to the Padlet. Um, that's kind of a, a collaborative little uh, board where we can uh, anonymously, I should note, share uh, ideas. So we are working to adapt some of our curriculum to be more tailored to faculty and instructor authors. Um, we'd love it if you would take a brief moment and think about what you'd like authors to know about this topic. If you've never used Padlet before, it's pretty easy. Just click the plus sign next to today's session, which is session three. Um, it'll open a sticky for you to write on. Um, you can even change colors and things like that. Um, go ahead and add your comment and then click publish to share it. Um, again, these are anonymous. We were really, uh, really curious to kind of get some of your feedback about what you would like your, you know, instructors that you're working with to know about how they can work with you, what sort of um, resources they might need, anything like that. So go ahead and add your comment and hit publish and, and we'll uh, kind of be taking a look at those as well. Um, so now we go ahead and move on to the Q&A. So please do feel free to share your questions and comments in the chat um, or raise your hand and we can call on you. As people kind of consider, uh, one thing that I was really thinking about a lot during this conversation, particularly as juxtaposed with last week's session, um, just the the relationship between uh, you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility seems to be so strong. I'm, I'm a little bit curious, Christina, how you um, kind of recommend, you know, do you do you feel like it's so important to always kind of speak about those together? Do you try to kind of frame them in sort of different approaches? How do you approach individuals who maybe come to you with one and are a little bit less interested in the other? Um, interesting question. <laughs> um, I I actually uh, so hmm, how do I think about this? Uh, I think people are more 
comfortable coming to you with accessibility questions and I like to put them together because we should be considering these all equally. Um, whether it's ableism, um, learning styles, uh, I mean, all of them are things that we should be considering. And and to me, they're user first centered. So if we're making a resource, it's for the students. So yes, we wanna make it accessible for the students, but if our language that we're using is so many, has so many barriers, does the, the physical or digital accessibility standards matter? We're still putting up barriers. So, um, I like to put them together to make it, I, re, I guess I feel like I'm trying to normalize DEI conversations, right? We should be text, we should be checking inclusive language constantly, everything we should do. We should be checking accessibility um, constantly with everything we do. So the more we normalize that, the more approachable it is and, um, and I, I can only speak as a white person, obviously, but I would say there's a lot of white academia that's uncomfortable joining into those conversations. And so, so the, but they understand accessibility and standards and practices. So the more we can like loop them together and be like, oh, is your PDF accessible? But also, did you include these like how to use guides? And would you consider changing some of your language to include vocabulary that's called out that students can understand and helping them to see that it's not a guilty thing. I didn't do something wrong. I just have to consider other perspectives. I think we can make changes more universal. It's my very long-winded answer, hopefully. <laughs> Makes sense. It wasn't an easy question. I appreciate it. So I, I just want to call out one of our lovely colleagues from the state of Florida who said it's so difficult to navigate. Um, being from Montana, I feel yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are things that um, we can do to have these conversations like, like this guiding authors checklist. Maybe you don't say the word diversity because that's a trigger word in your state. Um, but maybe you talk about approachable language instead or uh, a variety of perspectives. So there's ways that we can get towards these concepts and help individuals and faculty move this direction that is less triggering for those in conservative. Um, and conservative is not actually the right word to use, so I apologize for that. But um, states and institutions that have some of these hesitations or flat out you can't use these or do work in equity or diversity so yes proficient in synonyms yes i like that one all right Yeah, we've been using the words mattering and belonging quite a lot. Student belonging is really popular um, right now. I, I also, as we're hitting that big population bubble, bubble that a lot of institutions have worried about, um, I've started just using this retention, retention and success. The, these are our retention efforts. We're making better textbooks. We're making more accessible textbooks. Um, it's the same thing. I would like to call it for what it is, but also if that's gonna get you support and funding, call it what you need to call it.
maybe to add another uh, tricky accessibility question, but I, again, I feel like they do overlap. It's interesting when we, you know, we're thinking about that and there was a moment during the session where we talked about sort of universal design um, mm -hmm. and how in some cases universal design is ideal in, in that it kind of removes, um, you know, it, it really considers barriers and it really removes as many as possible. Um, but that depending on your, you know, situation, sometimes universal design maybe is, is less effective than design that is tailored perhaps to a particular community or a particular um, student group and, and things like that. Um, I'm curious kind of how you kind of consider these ideas of, of kind of universal best practices versus sort of that dynamic responsiveness that comes with, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. I go with the tough questions again. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so I think universal design, if we fully embraced it, would take us quite a long ways. Um, you can't design for all perspectives. And I think what becomes um, so important for me is faculty reaching your audience. I could write a fabulous textbook on whatever topic, and it might go over well really here in my community, but if I move this to like a urban Chicago university, it might not meet those, you know, that population as well. So how do I write with multiple perspectives? And I think that honesty is just the really hard ground foundation for me. If I'm honest, this is the perspective that I'm covering. This is where I'm coming from. And and here's here's the areas that I didn't look. Not only is it going to invite my students to look elsewhere or, or engage in other communities, but when I have someone from a community that's very different reading that material, it is respectful and honoring that maybe their perspective isn't included. So maybe they want to take, and this is where I see such potential in OER, maybe they want to take my textbook and add those perspectives or shift. I, I think it is human, so it's a moving target. Um, it's always going to be imperfect and it's always going to have missing voices. But the more honest we are, at, we are about that, the better quality we get. I, um, I also think we have gotten very complex in design. I, I heard an OER session a few years ago at a conference about let's make ugly OER. I was like, oh no, <laughs> like I like to make it beautifully designed, pretty, but also is that benefiting the most people? And maybe I have to back up and say the most benefit is something that is very streamlined, is very simple. Um, and then depend on my faculty to teach to their audience, right? Again, what's the purpose of my content? Am I just sharing information? I think that's going to vary dependent on discipline. So I, I think universal design has a place, but I also think it's flawed because it it's not going to fit every situation either. And Amanda, I wasn't saying let's make ugly OER. <laughs> that was just the name of the session and it, it did crack me up, but I understood his point. <laughs> yeah, and I do get the point. I do get the point because that's also sort of, I was in a keynote recently about like, let's do messy AI. Like, let's not worry oh. about like setting all of the best practices before people start using it because you get too far behind the learning curve is the point there. Yeah. But like, when it comes to OER, whenever people mo move to that, like, let's make ugly OER, let's just get it together and do it. Like, I'm there for the spirit of that. But I'm also like, oh, please don't, because then the instructors are like, this is poor quality. I would never adopt this. <laughs> Yeah, and then we go back to where we were like yeah. 15 years ago where they're like all the OER is crap. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go back there. <laughs> okay, well, um, I hope this was helpful. Again, you've got some great resources in your Pub 101 curriculum and um, 
my slides, have my contact info. I'm always happy to talk about DEI issues with anyone. So feel free to reach out. And within the, the link tree, you will find that we do have a link to a feedback form. That's always very helpful for us. If you do choose to leave us some tips and tricks for what we can improve on or what you really appreciated here. Um, so thank you for doing that in advance. Um, thank you so much, Christina. We really appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, thank you all for joining us as we continue to learn about open textbook publishing. We hope that as we continue to share available resources and recommend recommendations, um, your, one of your key takeaways is the sense that you're not alone in figuring out how to support open textbook authors. Um, and as you hear from you know today's lesson, it is human work and it's uh, it's a little bit messy and we do really appreciate the effort and the interest in this work. Um, so we do really look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, the session will be, you know, linked. You can find that on that orientation materials. Um, so we do hope you will join us. That will be talking about MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, we really appreciate it.